Thanks very much. So appreciate everybody coming out. Um, I'm sure you're all missing like your most important class today. <laughs> um, so what I thought I'd do um, is kind of this, this is what I thought I'd talk about is kind of subtitle from Makiki to Manoa here. Um, as you might guess from that, that I was born and raised and grew up in uh, Makiki, not just a couple of miles from here. Uh, I thought what I'd cover today is kind of my background, early background, um, the foundation that it laid, some of the considerations I had uh, while I was a student here um, and afterwards, and then a little bit about my work history, spending more time talking about kind of the things that I learned and how that either helped me or kind of refined my thinking uh, over the course of uh, my career. And then since this is kind of more of a, my background is a little more corporate, although there is a lot of innovation that kind of happens obviously in Silicon Valley, um, kind of five key takeaways that I think would be relevant um, um, for this group or for anyone. So before I kind of jump into background, I'd like to know um, how many of you are undergrads here? Raise a show of hands. Any graduate students? Any people older than that? <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, great. Um, and then, uh, so the ones that are current students, how many of you um, grew up here? How many of you went to public schools here? All right. So. I also am a product of the uh, Honolulu Public School System. Uh, went to uh, Roosevelt High School, thank you very much, uh, right up the street. Um, and uh, grew up in a, a family where both my mom and dad didn't get a chance to go to college. Um, and we had, a, but we had a small kind of coin collecting business. And why I'm spending a little bit of time on that is, uh, so in junior high and high school, I actually didn't work at Zippy's, didn't work at McDonald's for my um, part-time uh, spending money, but was in my uh, dad's coin business. And it was great, it was, you know, obviously didn't have to dress up, could stay at home. But um, he had this great idea about, he wouldn't pay me by the hour or by how hard I worked, but it's basically whatever we sold, I'd get half the profit. Which is great when you sell stuff, <laughs> And if you don't sell stuff and you work really hard, you basically stay at home on weekends. So I learned very early on, I think from a business standpoint, you know, kind of what, uh, what the goals are. I also learned very early on that by nature, I'm a little bit of an, I'm an introvert and the you know, nature of selling, that kind of doesn't work really well. So I hated that aspect of it. Um, which later I think in my career has actually helped me a lot because even though most of the time I've spent on the financial side of things, that early kind of exposure and, and education has really helped me maybe identify more with the sales process, with sales leadership, and understanding that it's, you know, that it's a challenge. It's, it's, uh, it's a tough go when you're, uh, uh, when you're having to work on commissions every day. So anyway, that, uh, um, and then, it's interesting because it wasn't a foregone conclusion that I would even um, go to college. Um, my brother had just gotten out of the Navy. He also wanted to start a small coin investing business and said, but he didn't really have any expertise. So he said, well, my younger brother has expertise, so let's get him right out of uh, high school and you know, we can go into business together. My dad really didn't like that idea. Um, so I ended up actually turning that down and um, ended up coming to UH. So a little bit about kind of educational um, considerations. So I came here what seems like a lifetime or two lifetimes ago. Some of your parents may not have even been born then. Um, uh, so anyway, came to UH in uh, 1976, and because of the exposure I'd had to in high school, it's like, I kind of like something in business. I know I don't like the external or sales side of things, so what's the one way you can get a decent job coming out of school? It's like, well, kind of do the back office stuff, the accounting side. So that's what I majored in. Um, was for, I wish, I really wish 
things like pace were set up because there was actually at that point in time kind of zero exposure to entrepreneurship. I mean, basically, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you, you just did it. You didn't, there was no education process uh, or kind of hands-on process or ways to facilitate that. So um, that might have changed things for me because I think that that was an interest of mine, but there's no real way to, to, to do that. Um, so anyway, I got my uh, degree in accounting. And what do you do with a degree in accounting? You work for a CPA firm. So I worked for a couple of years uh, here in Honolulu with uh, uh, one of the large CPA firms. And even though I knew I didn't want to do that long term, but it's, I felt it would be a good way to get exposure. Since I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, good way to get exposure to a number of different companies. Uh, ended up working on um, uh, focusing a lot on uh, banks and financial institutions, also a number of healthcare institutions, um, and uh, actually um, colleges and university audits. So that was kind of my background. And actually, while I was at um, uh, while I was here at uh, Manua, I uh, decided that I knew I wanted to get a little bit of background, but I also wanted to see what it was like, kind of away from. The island since I'd born and raised and literally went to elementary school, junior high, high school, not just two miles away and, and almost walked to school for most of that period of time. So I, yeah, I should probably try to broaden out a little bit. So I was fortunate enough to get, um, I did apply to Scheidler. It wasn't Scheidler at the time, but I did. <laughs> um, but I uh, elected to go to, uh, to uh, uh, get my MBA at Stanford. And the one thing, and actually why I chose that was not because I didn't want to come to UH. UH didn't have a dome. So remember Roosevelt has that dome? <laughs> but Stanford has a tower and a dome. So I said, well, th this has got to be the right place. It's kind of a little bit of comfort for me. Same color, too. <laughs> so it's mostly the same color, yes. <laughs> um, so while I was there, that was probably, as I think back in my life, kind of the hardest or the... Um, um, the most difficult time, in part because I was really out of my comfort zone for just from physically being in a different place, um, kind of the competitive element a little bit, as well as um, I made a conscious decision since I knew I didn't, I didn't th even though I was pretty good at it, I kind of was sure I didn't want to spend my whole career in ac accounting. Um, I said, I'm not going to take any accounting classes, um, and uh, did my emphasis in finance and marketing. And that was a little bit of a, a stretch, because um, uh, you can imagine, especially with most people getting work experience before going to uh, graduate school, I was in classes with people that were product marketing managers for Procter & Gamble, or with people that had spent several years with Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley and Wall Street. So when you're in a finance class with people that have already done that, you're kind of a little behind. Um, so that was it, was, it was tough, but I think the one key takeaway for me, and I consciously did that, and I think it's really important, especially um, I mean, you guys know this from an entrepreneurship standpoint, is a number of people have been you know, attributed with this quote, but you know, do the one thing that you, know, you cannot do or you're afraid to do. So for me, it was make sure I, I got exposed to things that I wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to. Now, I didn't know where it was going to lead, but I just thought eventually that'll, that'll help and it'll at least broaden my perspective uh, on things. So that's how I thought about moving away. That's how I thought about what um, curriculum to take. And that's also how I thought about um, what I would do post um, the MBA program. Um, so I had um, a number of opportunities or options. Um, if I can remember them now, one of them was to go back uh, with Ernst and do um, not auditing, but do system consulting and do that in LA. So well, that's kind of cool. Uh, another one was to uh, join a firm that had offices throughout the Western US that did executive financial planning, investment counseling, uh, which, okay, I haven't done that, but I, I can do that. That's, that's 
kind of cool. And by the way, those two actually paid really well um, for the time. Uh, there was another opportunity to join uh, American Airlines in uh, Dallas as part of their um, kind of management training program and financial planning. It was another opportunity to join a manufacturing company in, in, uh, uh, in Ohio um, as a senior accounting manager. The one that I ended up choosing was with a smaller, newly public startup company, uh, semiconductor company in Silicon Valley. And I didn't really know anything about semiconductors. I really didn't know a lot about tech. Um, but I thought about it as, what's the one thing that, you know, I'm not gonna have the chance to do again? All those other things, if if something messed up, I could always come back and do financial planning. I could always come back and do consulting. I knew I could come back and, and um, you know, do accounting, and it didn't matter where it would be. But the one thing I knew I couldn't do is if once I left, I'm, it's hard to get back and kind of re-enter and find an entry point into, um, uh, into Silicon Valley, and particularly into a younger, uh, you know, uh, chip manufacturer. So that's what I did. So I joined, um, so I'll now transition to kind of work history. So I joined VLSI Technology, which was a uh, semiconductor manufacturer that had, the prior year had just gone public. So it was relatively small in 1984 dollars. I think it was, it was less than $100 million at that time. So that's probably what, $300 million today. Um, and again, it was one of the lower paying opportunities, but you know, I'm not gonna get this chance to, to, to do this again. So, and just started as a financial analyst and didn't really know anything about the industry. Actually, the only, I did know something about the industry. I think when I was a, um, when I was a junior here, um, I did a, pa I remember I did a paper on uh, comparing two semiconductor companies. It was National Semiconductor, which was the bigger firm, and then a small startup firm called Intel. <laughs> uh, that's how old I am, but anyway. Um, so that was kind of my perspective or understanding of the uh, semiconductor industry. And um, so what I did was I just said, well, I'm just, you know, there was, was no internet at the time, so you actually had to buy books to, to read or to catch up. So it's like I learned about vapor deposition. I learned about how you did etching in a manufacturing process, how, you know, you did connectivity, and half the stuff I didn't know what I was reading or understanding that much, but it helped me converse with both technical people, people that were in sales, so that they didn't look at me as just, well, that's just the financial guy. So it's like I could actually have a discussion kind of impact uh, on the business. So, um, so I did that, learned a lot there, got promoted, um, was, uh, was, I didn't realize it at the time, but was fortunate to have a chief financial officer at VLSI who ended up being a very, uh, noted uh, chief financial officer that went on to uh, be, be at Siebel Systems, Sybase, uh, Cybase, um, uh, Excite at Home, uh, Yahoo. Um, and I learned a lot from him because he's probably the most brilliant financial person that I know or manager of concepts and things. Notice I didn't say people. Um, so he was, uh, re let's just call a really tough guy to work for. But again, it's, so it's like it's not a good part of the job, but it's something that you learn. So I had the opportunity there. I got recruited uh, then into a smaller company, a, a startup company that was still private at the time called Whitech. And uh, what was attractive there is they were private. They were just selected bankers to get ready to go to their IPO. The one thing I hadn't demonstrated on, in my background was the ability to manage people. So I, again, had, was developing expertise, but this was the opportunity to, to do that. It was about a 15-person organization, so not big, but a um, uh, chance to do that. Also, it was a chance to work for Another CFO, so I've been really lucky. The second CFO that I worked for also ended up being a real luminary in, in Silicon Valley. 
And he was kind of the opposite. He was a good people motivator, uh, real strong kind of strategic background. Not that strong <laughs> in finance and definitely not that strong in accounting. In fact, one of the, one of the things that I hated the most about that job is because that CFO didn't know a lot about accounting, he, when we would do like quarterly reviews, he would, we would literally spend six hours going through tracing transactions, reconciling general ledgers to subsidiary ledgers, just stuff I hated. I did some of that, you know, audited some of that at uh, Ernst, but I just, man, that's the stuff I didn't want to do. But he kind of made me do it, and not because he didn't necessarily trust me, but that was, that was his blind spot. So that was the way that he kind of said how he's making up for his uh, weakness. So anyway, did that, even though I just hated it. Um, CFO left. Uh, I got promoted to chief financial officer, so at 32 years old, thinking, boy, this is absolutely great. You get to impact strategy. This is kind of fun. Get to talk to investors <laughs> in Wall Street. And then the company hit a recession, or the industry hit a recession, and within a period of a year, revenues were cut in half. We ended up, I ended up having to affect three layoffs, which you never, you never like to do one, but if you're gonna do them, you do it once and then be done with it. But I'm kind of was a junior CFO, so I'd, we didn't know how to pick the bottom. And it was just really tough. Um, and also think about it as you're a you know, younger CFO and you're talking to investors who've lost a bunch of money and you, they're like, they're not happy. Uh, so really tough period, but I said, I'm gonna kind of see this through. When I, by the time I left, we had um, gotten revenues back up 50%, got back up to profitability, cash flow positive. And then I, and then I decided I do not want to have anything to do with the semiconductor industry ever again, just because it's so cyclical. So it's, again, a lot of things that you learn what you, what you want to do, you also learn what you don't want to do. It just takes me a little while to figure that out. So I said, software's great. Part of what I did at VLSI was, was having a software group uh, that uh, 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 in my division. Um, and so I liked the business model. Uh, it was a private company again. They were looking to go public within a year. Um, I would be their first CFO. Uh, and so, and it's and it was fa financial risk management or kind of banking software for derivatives. Which oh, I learned a little bit about that in uh, 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 through the uh, MBA program. I knew a little bit about banking through what uh, I had done at uh, Ernst and. Um, so I thought this is great. The other thing that was really attractive was um, Katz was one of the first companies that uh, had a subscription model for software. So um, you know, most software, big software has been licensed on a perpetual basis. Only in the last five years have, have you know, the software as a service or subscription based software model has really taken hold. Katz was one of the very first companies to license only on a subscription basis. So it's a great model. I knew that. We went public with that. So I'm thinking, boy, this is, I'm the luckiest person in the world. This really worked out great. So we went public, had a successful offering despite a, again, another recession at that point in time coming out of the recession. And in less than two years, I quit. Um, and you say, well, what the hell? I mean, it's, it's kind of a, why would you do that? Um, again, one of the learnings I had was nothing's worth it if you don't trust and relate to the team. And we had a pretty dysfunctional executive team and a leader or leadership that wasn't willing to change. And I stayed as long as I could to try to affect that. But at some point you say, this is just eating me up, it's not fun, it's not, it doesn't matter how good something looks on paper and how much it potentially is helping your career. If it's eating you up every day, either you're in or you're out. So I decided to be out. Um, was fortunate that I got recruited to a healthcare systems company called Omnicell and was actually recruited there by um, a friend of another, a partner of another board member that was at Waytech. So they, were, they had this healthcare systems company that was starting up and um, 
uh, got to, was recruited as chief financial officer there, um, got a little broader span of control. Um, I kind of liked most of the management team. I knew the CEO would be a challenge to have a partnership with because um, he was very, very, very sales driven almost to the point of, you know, if you're on the finance side, it's you have to worry about how aggressive are you being from a sales standpoint? Are you doing some of the right things? So I, but I knew that going in. Um, so that worked pretty well. And quite frankly, if, um, if I didn't get recruited into Informatica, I probably might still be at um, OmniCell. In fact, today, uh, I think I just looked at their last quarter. They're now at a $750 million revenue run rate of $3 billion market cap. But at the time, it was a very slow growing kind of $75 million company. And if you think about that time frame, that's during the dot com boom. So you're at a healthcare company, which is generally a slow moving, slow growth or industry, or slow to change industry. And everything else is you know, getting huge valuations, growing really quickly around you, and this company couldn't, even though it's a great company, with a long, great long-term model, it's gonna get there over a long period of time. Um, and uh, uh, so anyway, I got, there's a couple of other stories there which maybe we can talk about later, but uh, I did get to do my first, I guess one other thing, I did get to do the first acquisition of another company uh, at that point in time and also learned a lot from that because there were um, learned a lot about negotiation and um, learned a lot not just in terms of financial negotiation and try to find fit between product lines and technologies but there's a people aspect to it and I don't just mean the employees and things because the company that, the division that we were, product line that we were trying to buy from this larger healthcare uh, company, um, our CEO at OmniCell was a former sales leader for that other company. That I didn't realize it at the time, that he didn't leave on that great terms. So, and he was very much wanted to be in charge of the negotiation. And that just didn't work. And it, we, we, it took us three years, three different episodes to try to get this acquisition done. Even though we knew it was the right thing to do, the, the selling company knew this was the right home for it. But what got in the way, quite frankly, was the taint, as you will, of the CEO who wanted to be in charge of negotiations. So finally, we had a heart to heart after it failed, after a couple of years, said, you can tell me what you want me to do, but just, just stay in California. I'll go back, you know, to the Midwest, and and you know, you can whisper in my ear the whole time, but you don't show up. Just otherwise, we're never going to get this done. So the third year, we finally got it done. Uh, but um, so anyway, that was so that was that was great. It was it took a while, but it was again learning from my perspective. So in uh, 2000, I joined Informatica, and actually got a call from. Um, one of their board members, um, and it was the my former boss, the CFO at Waytech, who had moved on in his career and was on the board at Informatic, and said, "You know, we need a CFO. The guy that took us public isn't working out." Um, so um, I joined Informatica, and you know, it's not exactly a straight line, but. Um, you know, most CFOs last for about four years in Silicon Valley, so I consider this, I spent four lifetimes uh, at, at Informatica. So when I joined them, uh, we just closed a $60 million revenue year, had a couple hundred employees. I was responsible for kind of not only finance and accounting, but legal, IT, human resources, investor relations, and had about 40 people reporting to me. By the time I left, just from a size standpoint, the company's at you know, over a billion dollars, 3,500 employees. Um, that kind of, we talked, you know, I ran services, support, also kind of strategy, corporate development, and uh, the services and support part of the revenue stream is <coughs> over half a billion dollars, and uh, they about a, had about 1,000 employees, a little over 1,000 employees reporting to me. Um, it's global. 
Um, you know, it's got uh, employees in 20 countries, R&D in 10. And actually, one thing I forgot to mention, one of the other things back at CAPS, that financial software company, they were very global, even though they were relatively small. And they were selling to the largest financial institutions in the world. Uh, so about a third of their revenue came from Asia, mostly out of Japan. Uh, about a third of the revenue came from uh, Europe, kind of across um, you know, the financial centers, London, uh, and Switzerland, um, uh, Fr Frankfurt, and then uh, the other third coming mostly from the US. So um, we, that was a very global uh, company. I remember one of the first times, this was again back at CATS, um, I had to get on a plane. We had this big contract with, um, uh, with a large bank in London. And I'd, I'd never been to Europe at that point in time. Uh, I had never negotiated that kind of contract before. And it was a very, um, uh, it was a very tense situation because we needed the deal. They know we needed the deal but you can't give away everything. So anyway, it, there was a lot of learning. I made a lot of mistakes. I'm sure we gave away things that we shouldn't have given away, but you gotta learn somehow, and that was a big learning, which didn't help me as much at CATS, but it helped me a lot at, uh, at Informatica, because one of the things that we did very well um, as a team is, uh, you know, I mentioned we've got, R they had R&D in 10 different countries, and we did, you know, over a dozen uh, acquisitions. And these are mostly small technology companies. We didn't actually do the, we did the, the acquisitions less for revenue, more for filling in technology and how we're gonna broaden our product line. Um, and a lot of those, uh, companies, smaller companies, were in different parts of the globe. Um, now, when most big companies acquire small ones, you say, well, we're going to take the revenue stream, we're going to integrate people, we're going to shut down operations. We said, well, we're not going to win at that game, and we're, so how do we be different? How do we be a place where smaller, innovative startups will want to be a part of the organization? Say, well, we've got a really good um, R&D management team, let's figure out how to make things work and keep the talent in situ in place. So, so eight of the countries that uh, Informatica does R&D in are a result of acquisitions where you kept employees in place. So they have an R&D center in Canberra, Australia, in, uh, in uh, Toronto, in Canada, in Tel Aviv, in uh, Israel, in Kazan, Russia. Um, uh, in, uh, in Dublin, in Ireland, in the UK, in uh, Stuttgart, in Germany. So, so it's hard, it's kind of expensive to do, but if you kind of go in saying, this is the value on it, here's how, we're, here's how it's gonna help us, it'll keep our R&D or our technical turnover low, it gives us ability to actually to move work over the long term between different centers. Um, um, so we ended up being, where most companies would say they're lucky if they get a third of their acquisitions to be successful. I, we had 90, we had, how do you do it? So two of our, 10 of our 12 acquisitions met or exceeded what we had as our kind of three, our, put it together a three year plan, met or exceeded our three year plan. So. Um, it's something that we ended up doing well as a team, and I think part of it is because we had a very different perspective. Um, so let's see, um, what else do I want to talk about there? Um, yeah, so what I so I left Informatica in 2016. Uh, so I kind of don't have a day job. So if anybody you know <laughs> wants, I'm kind of unemployed. If anybody wants to hire me. And, you've got a really good idea you need some help with. <laughs> um, I am working uh, with, uh, uh, on the board of, was on the board of three companies. Uh, exactly Software got sold uh, to private equity last year. Uh, so that was a, a software company in, uh, in San Jose, currently on the board of Central Pacific Bank here, and just recently joined the board of uh, Hawaiian Airlines and chair the audit committees for, uh, for both of those companies. Um, Takeaways. Actually, how am I doing on time? Okay, great. So, um, takeaways from 
all of this rambling. <laughs> and I'll kind of go through them. And, and it's kind of motherhood and apple pie, but I want to at least try to put it in perspective in terms of what I've learned kind of in my career. So listen, that seems pretty obvious, um, but it's funny how um, if you're in, a lot of people I find in, particularly in, actually a lot of managers, uh, don't do this very well. Um, and, uh, but I think it's really important that, that you have this skill set. And the fact that I don't see anybody sleeping here, at least sort of listening, <laughs> um, listen actively, listen critically. And when I, when I, and I really mean that by saying, it's not just sitting there, it's like, okay, take it in. And if some things seem boring, it's like, yeah, 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 I know that. That's fine. If there are things that, no, 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 that's not right. Well, think about why do you think it's not right? That's what I said, think about it critically. It's like, if somebody's saying something that doesn't, if it matches with what, how you're thinking about something, okay, why does it match? What additional data points do you get from that so that later on maybe you can use that in kind of your supporting arguments? Um, uh, again, if it's something that doesn't match, that is, don't just then think about why doesn't it match? What, what, what can I either learn or what perspective does that person have that later on when you engage that, okay, that's a bias or something that you need to change. So I'm just saying listening is really important because it gives you the perspective of where that other person is coming from. And you know, I, I can't tell you how many times that just instead of saying, this is what I feel, this is what we should do, you kind of listen, whether it's people that work for me, my peers, whether it's people that we were, um, other companies or investors that we we're trying to deal with, getting really, un trying to listen to what they're saying or what they're, how they're thinking about something, it has been just tremendously valuable and I think it's, it's something that many times people don't do well enough. Um, ask questions, and this kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the listening part, because if you do, do both of those right, you'll be successful in kind of no matter what you do. So, um, and I say two points there. Ask questions, especially early on. Um, you know, I kind of subscribe to there are no dumb questions, but actually there are, because if you're like in the, <laughs> last class of a semester and yeah, what happened in session one? Well, duh, ask the question in session one. What, um, so that's what I say, ask questions, ask them early on. So, so for me, uh, I kind of relate that back to the biggest point of learning for me was uh, when I was at VLSI Technology. So brand new industry, I didn't know tech. I'm not gonna fool people, they know I, was a CPA and just got a brand new MBA and I don't know anything. Um, but, but, you know, so ask questions, especially that first year I asked a lot of questions. Just what, how, why do you do that? What are we doing here? And, um, and you find people that will help you with that. Um, so again, that's where I think asking questions early on can be really helpful. Um, and then the other questions just kind of in whether it's in negotiations or whether it's in dealing with your employees or dealing with um, peers. Um, to me, asking kind of probing open-ended questions, again, I use that kind of with the listening piece, is really important because it's not only, um, you know, you, and it's not to be you're testing them. It's like you're trying to find out how much do they know? What perspective do they have? If they have a different perspective than you, it's like, well, why do they do that? How are they thinking about it? Um, again, it's really to gauge the other person or the other party's understanding uh, because then that'll help you kind of reformulate, well, this is how I need to approach it. This is how I need, to, I can't just have my pitch. I need to think about it. Well, they've got this perspective, so I need to come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, uh, develop expertise, I think that's um, pretty basic. Kind of know the material, know your subject matter. Um, from, and again, you don't have to know everything, but this is where I think about it for, for in 
my career, it's like, know something well. So for me, it was starting in accounting. It's pretty boring, but I knew that well. Well enough to where when I did my MBA program, I didn't have to spend any time on that. I could, I could, that, I could push myself in other areas that, um, that I knew I didn't have expertise that I could you know, potentially learn more and get uh, better rounded. Um, and that goes to kind of anything. It's uh, back, if I look through my career, every time I picked up a new area, I would, whether it was legal or IT or human resources, the first year or so after I picked up that new area, I spent a disproportionate amount of, of my time in that new area. Not mostly to get my learning and get my understanding up because I think I knew enough or built enough expertise in the things that I had known or built or over the last, you know, prior parts of my career. So it's like, again, come back to almost do the thing you're afraid of, the thing that, you know, you, um, um, you cannot do. It's the area that you don't have expertise in, push yourself in that area. Or make sure that you know enough to say, I gotta hire a really, really good expert, but you need to know enough to know what that expert looks like. Um, I think you can translate that to know your customer, know your, know your audience, and again, I use that kind of it builds on kind of the listen and ask, ask question standpoint. It's, it's make sure you understand who you're talking to or, or who you're having negotiations or discussions with because uh, we, we, I think it's too easy for us to get caught up with, this is what I know, this is what I want to convey, this is where the outcome I want to get to, so I'm just going to try to get there. Well, yeah, sometimes you can get there straightforward and it's really quick. Other times, it's probably better to know what the other party wants to get out of it. What are they trying to, where's the win-win? Try to understand where they're coming from, and that'll help you get to kind of your win situation. Uh, again, similar, know the need you're trying to fulfill. And then I think finally, just kind of know, know yourself. Know what works for you. Um, know when to push yourself out of the comfort zone. Or for me, it's like there were, you know, I kept thinking of my career as well, I'm just going to do this, going to build, going to do this, do this. And it wasn't until um, very late in my relatively late in my career when I was at CATS where it's like, you know, none of this matters if I really don't like the people I'm working with. It's, and it's kind of basic, but it really didn't hit me that I'm willing to make that trade off because that's more important to me than, 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 you know, than earning a higher salary, getting a higher return. It, it just was more important at that point. Um, so. Be all in, be passionate. Um, I did, there's, just, there's just no substitute for hard work. There's no substitute for throwing yourself in anything. And even if it's a boring job like public accounting, even if it's working for a CFO that makes you sit for six hours at the end of a quarter, just drilling you, it's like, okay, either you're in or you're out. So if you're in, just be all in, because there's gonna be good and bad with it. Um, but as long as you're there, it's just be all in until you're not. Because at some point, you'll get to a point where yeah, it's, it's not worth it or there's something better. But until that point comes, just be all in. Because you don't know where, you don't know where down the road that will come back to help you. So if I blew off my CFO at, at Waytech and said, dude, <laughs> You know this is right. Why, why are you putting, if I really challenge him on that, he'd look at me differently, and he probably wouldn't come back, you know, what is it, six years later to say, hey, Earl, this, I got this role at Informatica that I think would be a great, great position for you. So again, you just don't know where, where things um, uh, come from. And it is, and it does help when it's, it's contagious, it really is. I mean, if you're, it's funny, I even think back, this kind of made me think back to when I first started at VLSI. Yeah, I was a newbie, I didn't know the industry, but I asked questions. People could tell that, you know, I wanted to learn and that I was trying to help. And guess what, they made time. And, and it, it, you know, we ended up building a very good, you know, collegial group. Um, develop relationships. <laughs> 
again, it, it's, this is kind of motherhood and apple pie. It is not just what you know, but it is who you know, and it's both of those that are really important. And I think early on, um, I know I would think about it as <clears throat> um, uh, I probably spent more time trying to make contacts or develop relationships with senior people. Um, that, well, they're going to help me get the job. They're going to help me get the next lead. They're going to, and and that's good, and that that does help, and and it and it's helped me. Don't overlook your peers, because later in your career, that network will be much more important than <coughs> old guys like me. We'll we'll be dead, man. We'll be <laughs> we'll be gone. Uh, so your peers, because, because think about it, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, you all, you're doing great things now, you're gonna be doing greater things and have bigger networks, and you'll be able to tap into that, even in ways that you, know, you can't even imagine today. So, so that's the one thing, if, if there's any regret maybe that I have, is I probably didn't spend as much time as I could have in, in that area. So I think that's really important. Um, so anyway, if none of that works, then just be lucky. So I'm going to, how, how much time now? 10? No. Okay, let me, let me, I'm going to use up a couple minutes on be lucky, because there's a, there's a um, this might be a long story, but so when I was at uh, Informatica, we had done a number of successful acquisitions, and we were desperately trying to pick up this one um, division, software division of this very, very large uh, European-based global communications giant that we knew wanted to sell that piece. Um, so, because we had a, kind of, they have a one-page teaser and they're trying to get $125 million for this little, little uh, te uh, technology subsidiary. And they had hired a um, kind of a second tier investment bank that actually didn't know software but knew the communications and industry and was pals with the, with the uh, uh, corporate, uh, uh, with, with the European company. And, um, and there was also, there was a corporate development team with the parent that said we want to sell, sell, sell. They hired a, the second tier investment bank. There was a U.S. Uh, junior U.S. corporate development or eminent uh, mergers and acquisition person that was in charge of doing the sale, kind of a lower level person. And then there was the management of the company. So my corporate development lead was said, well, we've got to buy them. So I got an initial contact with the corporate development person, of the U.S. person of the, so the, basically the U.S. representative of the, of the parent. And then they went dead silent and silent for like weeks. And we couldn't get a response from him. Um, it got to a point where my CEO just, I had a great relationship with the CEO at Informatica. He, this is one of the few times he got mad, he swore at me and the <coughs> corporate developer, what the hell he got? It's like, I can't help it, they're, they're not returning calls. I mean, and, and I know we're, we're following up like every, every you know every couple of days so finally I just I couldn't take it. I said I, I just so I'm just gonna call so I called that corporate the junior corporate development person who's supposedly US East Coast based I remember I called at like 11 o'clock Pacific time and the guy picks up and and I know he didn't mean to pick up because as soon as he picks up, I could hear in the background there's chatter and it's like you can tell it's kind of bar or dinner chatter, <laughs> which meant he's not on the East Coast, which meant, ah, he's in Europe somewhere and I, I'm not going to let him go at this point. This is the first contact we've had in a month. So it's like, so I said, we're really interested. I'm willing to even consider paying your exorbitant 125 million. So it's, I'm doing all the things that you'd never do in a negotiation just because we needed to kind of get engaged. So he was like embarrassed because he tried desperately to get rid of me off the phone. And I just, I'm going to send you, a, I'm going to send you my contact information. I'm going to put this in writing. I'm going to copy the, um, you know, the junior banker, I'm going to copy the head of the, uh, uh, the, the division that we're trying to buy to let you know how serious we are. So I sent him that email right away. And a couple of hours later, I get, I get a reply. 
except he made a mistake because he hit reply all and I shouldn't have been copied on it. So he sent an email which, which documented my, our interest to the junior banker and the, the lead of the guy running the division and basically said, we've got a problem. Informatica looks like they're interested. Our financing is, may not come through. What do you want to do? So what was going on? Why they never returned a call? Unbeknownst to the parent company um, and the partner in this junior uh, this lower tier investment bank is there was kind of uh, uh, definitely a conflict of interest, but they were trying to do a management buyout for like $75 million and not tell the parent company. So it's like, I got this email, well, I think we can do something with this. So anyway, long story short, within in three weeks, we had a letter of intent. We ended up buying the company for $75 million. I'm sure a couple of people got fired over it um, on their side. But again, this was just lucky, right? Somebody messed up. But I, I, I'll also come back to say, we probably did all those other five things too in terms of kind of listening, asking questions. Um, so it's like you, you kind of have to do some homework sometimes to recognize when you're, uh, when you're lucky. But being lucky helps. So I, I think I've been lucky. Um, you know, obviously started, uh, started in Makiki and I'm ending up here. So, so thank you very much. <laughs>